Hi friends, uh, today we are going to discuss about resilience biomarkers. I am Dr. Suresh Padatmat, Professor of Psychiatry, Head of Telemedicine Center, working at Nimans, Bangalore. In the previous video, we have discussed about resilience. And the simple definition of resilience is, it is the ability to bounce back from any adversity. So, that's the simplest definition of resilience. Let's look at the various resilience factors. As you see, this is the human body. And the resilience has two important things. One is core internal resilience factors and the external supportive resilience factors. If you look at the internal resilience factors, they're all basically genetics in nature. That's the how the body constitution has been made and also good mental health, physical health, lifestyle, genetic makeup, and also the way our physical health is being maintained and also accepting and dealing with disability and personal meaning in life. Coming to the external supportive resilience factors, they are basically social networking, family support, spiritual and religious factor and help seeking behavior. So these are the various what we call it as a resilience internal core factor and external supportive factors. But however, these definitions have been defined in various ways. Now, if you look at the research on stress and resilience, there has been various challenges. The first and the foremost is the definition of stress and the definition of resilience has been varied across various studies and research. Hence, it becomes very difficult to compare. At the same time, if you look at the three decades back, the focus of research was mainly on disasters and the development of psychopathology. Basically, if there is a disaster, who are the people who developed PTSD? How many developed depression? How many developed dissociative disorder? So it was more of looking at psychopathology. In the past one to two decades, the focus shifted from psychopathology to resilience because many of them do not develop any kind of disorders. That means there are a group of human beings or animals who do not develop any kind of disorders and they bounce back very fast. Considering this, the focus of research shifted towards the resilience. At the same time, this concept was shifted from individual resilience to community resilience and also corporate resilience. Community means basically if a community, how do they cope with the disaster? At the same time, if there is a corporate or an organization, how do they cope with the loss and how they bounce back? And what are the factors these corporate industries do have so that they do not go the lockdown? At the same time, we discussed about core resilience factors and external resilience factors. But again, the definitions and acceptance across various studies is very difficult to know. At the same time, the measurement of resilience is highly subjective. The reason being is internal core factors. However, some of the biomarkers have been very well studied. But however, the core involvement of biomarker as a genetics or genes have not been clearly defined. Or also the science has not gone to that level. We can pinpoint them. But again, the resilience scales and assessments are very subjective in nature. That's basically many a time the person's response depends upon that. However, there are various interesting studies have been published in various scientific journals. One of them is a very important study which was by a Mayo Clinic which talked about exceptional human longevity or else they are also called as super agers or centenarians like people who lived more than 100 years. What are their genetic makeups? What are their psychological factors? How did their environment? What was their lifestyle? And this, the whole study has been published in the 2019. Please do look into this, an interesting study. I think the people who are working in resilience should know this, why there are uh, some group of people who live more than 100 years and what are their body makeup, constituents, and what is their lifestyle do play a role. Moving to this, coming to the biomarkers. I spoke about the external factors. Now, the, how the body is being made up. That means not only the external environment, but also the internal environment play an important role in resilience. That basically, an animal, 
how does it respond to the changing environment maybe the environment is adversarial sometimes supportive so we may not have complete control over the environment to some extent at this point of time yes but however the internal environment that is the body is under the animal control to some extent again so both are dynamic in nature internal env environment and the external environment so to understand the internal environment we should know about the biomarkers basically biomarker was defined by who world health organization clearly says that any measurement reflecting an interaction between a biological system and a potential hazard which may be chemical physical or biological the measured response may be functional and physiological biochemical at the cellular level or at the molecular interaction basically it talks about there should be a biomarker which we can clearly identify and say that yes this if this biomarker is there that means this person is resilient if there is an absence that means that person has a high uh, possibility of breaking down or mortality that is the person's may die coming to the biomarkers there has been a good definition which has been best resource guide which has been by, defined by fda and nih resource book is there please do look into it and an indicator basically the definition is an indicator of normal biological process or patho pathogenic process or a response to any exposure or intervention basically it should be an indicator if you do any kind of exposure or patho pathogenic exposure or a process once you exposed to certain things they should be accurate reproducible and measurable that means if i am going to measure them we should be able to measure these biomarkers so that we will be able to say that this person is resilient first and the foremost again coming back to this definition of resilience is very difficult but at the same time you should also know what is the genotype so phenotype and the genotype are there in one hand on the other hand the outside environment which is hostile the basically it may be virus it may be bacteria or it may be a disaster so that is the environment outside the internal environment is the animal who has genetic makeup who is the body how it has been built how the lifestyle is there those are the issues which talks about the biomarkers further in simple words biomarker means a biological marker or a biological measure of biological state we are able to measure the state that is what is called as biological marker let's understand how the biomarkers are identified first and the foremost is a biomarker is discovered or what we call it as started studying on certain biomarkers maybe genetics maybe genes and those genetics or genes are considered as a candidate biomarker and extensively it will be studied and the correlation of the biomarker and the physiological state should be established once it is established clinical validation has to be done then it will be considered as a biomarker let's take certain examples in a short while so there are various way of classifying the biomarkers depending upon the pathogenic maybe virus related maybe bacteria related maybe disaster related it may be internal environment or maybe external environment the simplest way of putting across the classification of markers may be based on risks maybe safety diagnostic biomarkers monitoring biomarkers treatment response biomarkers pharmacodynamic response biomarkers and prognosis biomarkers so various biomarkers revolving around an illness has been defined very well and at the same time how the biomarkers available or present or absent based upon that the prognosis of the disease and the morbidity and the mortality of the animal or the human being will be decided first and the foremost the biomarkers can be a specific cell maybe a gene maybe an enzyme protein hormones mono amino amino acids and various other things but however let's understand these biomarkers especially has been well defined and extensively studied especially in the breast cancer if you look at the human epidermal growth factor receptor 2 it is usually called as her2 is a very important receptor which is presence or absence will decide the prognosis of the breast cancer at the same time estrogen receptor progesterone receptor presence or absence the responsibility <clears throat> will decide the chemotherapy also the immunotherapy and depending upon that we call it as a precise medicine or a precise drug therapy can be decided at the same time various other genetic biomarkers have been defined in 
breast cancer. So breast cancer is one of the best way to understand the biomarkers we is used for identification, treatment selection precisely and what medication to be given. Moving to the COVID infection, at present we are seeing coronavirus infection. You can take the body itself as an internal core factor, coronavirus as a hostile environment. Now under that circumstances, how the body behaves? That's the internal environment. The internal environment may be age, may be diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cholesterol or kidney failure or kidney disease which is already present. The whole forms the core environment along with the body how it responds to the virus that is how our immunity behaves. So that forms the internal environment. The external environment may be the pathogen inside the, outside the environment that is coronavirus. At the same time you can also consider some of the biomarker may be hand washing, wearing mask, physical distancing which decreases the chances of infection. So this is how we can divide between the internal core resilience factor and the external core resi uh, support resilience factor. This is how the virus comes in and the way we are discussed. But the COVID situation at this point of time in the past 8 to 10 months, there has been an extensive study on biomarkers to know what are the different way the COVID virus is reacting with the body and the, how the body decides. First and the foremost is the diagnosis, what we call it as for the COVID-19 is very essential. Before we know whether that person is infected or not, we use various technology. RT-PCR is the one common and also rat, rapid antigen test. So various ways we, we diagnose the person that is suffering from COVID-19. So that's a biomarker. Actually, it's a RNA based, what we call it as diagnostic factors. At the same time, the clinical biomarker says, what is the age of the person? The older the person, there is high chances of him dying or mortality. Diabetes, cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, hypertension and obesity, these have been found to be very highly, uh, what we call it as associated with poor outcome with COVID infection. Clinical serum biomarkers like urea and creatinine, if they are normal, it is well and good. If it is abnormal, the chances of survival decreases. CA reactive protein, procalcitonin, interleukin-6, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, amyloid, serum ferritin, cytokine coded by TNSF, 14 gene, IgMM and IgG body. So antibodies, these are the various things which are very essential inflammatory biomarkers. Of course, the person when most of the time when the person dies is because of the cytoskin storm and that storm is basically how the body reacts to the virus. That means internal environment becoming hostile which also takes down the animal. At the same time, we look at the vaccine. The vaccine is also being formed based upon the yes protein or what we call it a selective protein or a spike protein of the coronavirus. So on that basis, the vaccine are being studied. And now there are two more important vaccines have been looked up top upon or the candidate vaccine gene or a biomarker DNA based vaccine and also the mRNA based vaccines have been studied. Now coming on to the focus on research of biomarkers. See the whole biomarker industry is especially in stress and resilience looks on HPA axis that is hypothalamic, pituitary and adrenocortic axis. Now whenever there is any kind of stress, it may be relationship issues, exam failure, death or any other stress, the 3F will be triggered that is fight, flight or freeze. So as soon as the hypothalamus finds that there is what we call it as a stress, then the amygdala starts firing from there to the hypothalamus, pituitary and adrenocorticotropic hormone is released. From there it goes to the adrenal gland where the adrenaline or the corticosteroids are released. From there, the cortisol will start increasing the heart rate and also the increased respiration and fight or flight the body is prepared. At the same time, it also provokes sympathetic and parasympathetic system that is what we call it as autonomic nervous system. So this is how the body is prepared for the survival. Moving further, there has been a very interesting article which has been published by Barry Ocon et al. They also talked about a similar hypothesis, but they've added two more important things. Apart from HPA axis, 
autonomic nervous system, immune system and the gene expression. Gene expression is nothing but whenever the body is exposed to the extreme environment, maybe either hot or cold or maybe in the various environment, the genes are expressed to protect the body or protect the animal. So these how the moderating factors of memory, state, trait also plays an important role how the future that stress will be handled. So this is how a, a nutshell the Barry Oaken has clearly explained about the way the stress and resilience play an important role in the human body. Coming to the resilience biomarker, what is happening? Are we able to understand what is the biomarker? If it is there, that person is resilient. This will play a very important role because tomorrow if you are going to recruit some people for the purpose of any army or a working in a hostile environment or in an occupation, then if that person has a biomarker, he can be recruited. That's one way of explaining. And also the survivability of that person can also be determined. So the biomarkers will determine the way the person is going to deal with the adverse situation. If you look at the resilience factors, there is the internal core factors we are discussing. We are not discussing the supportive external resilience factor because they are beyond the scope of biomarkers. Now discussing about the core resilience, the physical health and the mental health part we can take it up. In the core factor, the both genetics and neuronal plasticity plays an important role. That means if a person is exposed to stress or a disaster or extreme stress or acute stress or a chronic stress, the person's genetic expression starts in the brain all over the body. In fact, neuronal plasticity actors, sometimes if it is in a chronic stress, that means there are some different ways of pathways do play a role. Coming to the physical health, neurodevelopmental disorders, if it is there and during the birth only, then the person has poor resilience. And at the same time, heart rate variability plays a very important role. Imagine there is a stress. Individually, if a person is exposed to any stress, the heart rate increases, palpitation, panic attacks do occur. And if there is heart rate variability is at the higher level and the variation is more, the person is resilient. That's how the animal survives because he is able to vary the heart rate depending upon the need of the environment. At the same time, if it is vaguely mediated heart rate uh, increasing or decreasing, that will play an important role. Congenital disorders imaging markers we will come to that shortly at the same time one of the excellent study about the neuropeptide y that is 36 amino acids which has been found to be if it is presence is at very high in the brain and that means is highly what we call it as resilient and the very other important is dehydro epiandrosterone if the presence is there again the person is resilient presence of oxytocin Oxytocin is nothing but a love hormone. If a person even under stress, if he feels that he has been loved, taken care, that means the person is will be able to be resilient. That means we are looking at the external environment where the family is supportive or the social support is there, then the oxytocin levels will be very high. Again coming to the alpregnolone, that is again a progesterone metabolite. If it is present, again that is also an indication of we call it as the resilient. Brain-derived neurotropic factors, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Again, adrenocorticotropic hormone, if it is consistently raised very high, then again it is a sign of, in the early part it is fine, in the later part it causes uh, the destruction in the uh, human body. Moving further, neuroimaging biomarkers. If an animal is exposed to the extreme hostile environment, what are the changes do occur in the brain? That was the interesting studies which have been found. That means the resilient brain adapts to the stress. The important areas which have been found to be adapt during resilience or a person who, are, who is considered as resilient is in the right prefrontal cortex or what we call it as a right amygdala and also right superior frontal gyri. These are the places where we have found consistently in the various imaging studies that the person is highly resilient and he is able to overcome any kind of disaster or stress, that person is resilient. At the same time, the amygdala is considered to be one of the seat of the center or a fear center or a what we call it as emotional center or a limbic center, what we call it as. These are the areas where the connectivity between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, if it is on the right side and the if there is 
increased activity or effective activity considered as a resilient. There are wonderful studies have been done. But again, these are all part of a PTSD studies after exposing towards the disaster. At the same time, if you look at the modulation of amygdala by prefrontal cortex plays a very important role for resilience if a child who has been exposed in a hostile environment in the childhood. And if he is able to modulate the amygdala through prefrontal cortex, he is highly resilient. So these are the various studies which have been published and I request you people to look into that. Coming to the other important is heart rate variability which I discussed. Heart rate variability is nothing but the time interval variation between the consecutive heartbeats. That's basically if there is a stress outside, the heart rate should be able to go up and withstand and then come down. That means the variation should be able to depending upon the outside environment. And it should be based on parasympathetic vagal tone more than the sympathetic vagal tone. Sympathetic vagal tone increases the heart rate but parasympathetic tone decreases the heart rate. And the relationship between heart rate variability and cerebral blood flow is a very important indicator for resilience. If the HRV is, the variation is very high, the blood flow to the cerebral brain is very, very good and the person is resilient. That is how the interpretation has been done by various studies. Coming to the, the last part of my presentation, the candidate biomarkers, some of the biomarkers have been found to be having in the HPA axis, which I discussed, the genetic polymorphism, is once one is considered monovino transporters, metabolic enzymes, circulating microRNA is the one which has been recently been discussed, and also the neuropeptide Y, which I discussed. These are the very important candidate gene biomarkers which have been studied in resilience. To conclude, dear friends, we are discussing about the resilience. Resilience has external and the internal factors. The external factors are family social society social networking those are the things which form the what we call it as the external factors the core internal factor is the animal himself that may be genetic makeup the lifestyles his food intake how he behaves what are the different genetic makeup or what are the disorders he has that forms the internal core phenomena including psychological factors now both internal core resilience factor and external resilience factors both are highly dynamic in nature so we are unable to control even one factor so under that circumstances doing studies only based upon the external resilience factor is simply impossible and we may not yield any much but hence we have to move towards the biomarker find out what are the biomarkers will predict the poor outcome good outcome diagnosis monitoring the prognosis especially we have seen in cancer so, dear friends, see, biomarker is the way to go forward to understand resilience. Whether the person has a biomarker may indicate that he is highly resilient or he is not resilient or there is high chances of he developing a disorder or decompensation because of the stress. If you like this video, please do subscribe to my channel. Stay safe.